Welcome to Shea Studio. It's our first roundup panel of the men's season. And um, it's tricky because men's wear seems so long ago because it's like it's constantly fashion week somewhere. Um, and there's always something going on. So it just seems very hard to talk about something that now feels so in the past. Um, we're going to be talking about the London shows. Um, and I've got an amazing set of experts from all different parts of the industry to, to help me unpick um, what happened this season. It, I think we'll probably talk about this, but it was a odd season. Like there's so much change in fashion at the moment. And this was kind of... Um, a season where a lot of a lot of the um, the sort of usual big brands on the London schedule weren't showing either because they're setting a season out because they're setting themselves up to do see now buy now or because they're uniting their men's and women so it was a, really a season of change so it's going to be hopefully a very interesting discussion and um, but before we kind of dive in I'll let you guys introduce ourselves you. Uh, Adam Kelly uh, buying and merchandise director at Fennec. Hi I'm Simon Chilvers the star director of matchesfashion.com I'm Rob Noble, and I'm the senior mentor editor of Style.com. And I'm Gray Moran, head of fashion and features at Focus. It's also Rob's birthday, so... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so do we right. sing that? No. <laughs> Let's Let's close yeah, we can close with it. That's I don't great. want me on YouTube singing. Yeah. <laughs> it's too embarrassing. Um, so yeah, as I said kind of before we kick things off, like it really was a kind of a big season of change, and I think in some ways that worked really well in London because it felt like there was such a focus on the kind of the young blood and the young designers because obviously Burberry weren't showing and usually they're such a kind of they kind of monopolize the week and the coverage in some ways um, but it did feel like a time of flux and I'm just I'm just interested to get everyone's thoughts on on sort of what's happening and how that's affecting particularly young designers so footfall was there yeah I think people you know that was in the general and it's a really hard time anyway because you've got pity uh, Milan and Paris straight after it. Mm -hmm. So some of those bigger stores which we were trying to attract to the UK and to yeah. London um, from Japan and from America really struggled to come. And yeah. So when they don't have some big headliners such as the Burberry, yeah. it makes it a lot harder for those guys to travel for expense and cost, just practicality. So yeah. the fact that we have all these amazing new designers and young talent, but we do need to offset that with some heavyweights. Yeah. Otherwise that period of time and that weekend and those few days doesn't aren't that relevant anymore yeah, and yeah. then I think we need to have a complete look to say actually is there just one fashion week yeah anyway that's a different but it's uh, no, yeah a, okay yeah, yeah that's a good point like in terms of how we should keep showing because I think people do have show apathy at the moment what, what's your take on it Rob it did feel like um, there was a gap I think um, in a way, you know, the young designers, a lot of them were really strong, but I think, it, to be honest, in some ways it did feel quite flat um, as a show season because yeah. um, normally you at least have a diversity of going from something that's very new and dynamic and energetic into something that's a bit more established and, you know, whether maybe the production quality is a little bit bigger and better and it's a bit more of an established branding, you know yeah. what you're going to get. Whereas this time it felt quite one note in a way yeah. and I think there were a few designers who managed to sort of break through that and and show themselves more as brands rather than as young designers yeah. um, but it, you did feel kind of the missing kind of energy of having well, a big that brand diversity brand. is what makes like mm. London interesting is, as you mm. say like it is going to see something like a Christopher Shannon after you've just seen a seating brand yeah. and it felt a bit more you, you were nodding through a lot <coughs> of the, the, well the newness thing is really important but as Adam says if people aren't here to see it that's kind of frustrating because obviously London is always talked about as the place where all the new stuff happens and that's still true but um, I think you do need the tension between seeing a big blockbuster Burberry thing and then going to see something really like smaller and more mm. kind of intimate like Peter or something mm. and the, the yeah. two do need to kind of coexist and it did have that kind of weird you know like you, you know it's McQueen not being there felt really strange to mm. me actually mm. I missed that weirdly more than Burberry in a way mm. um, because it's like there's something about the drama of that there's always a drama element to a McQueen show and I felt mm. that that was like something that was definitely missing from this from the schedule mm. I did think though that it sort of pushed a couple of designers up in a way yeah. like it made things like JW Anderson mm -hmm. and yeah. Craig Green yeah. feel like yeah. the kind of tentpole moments of the week yeah um, when perhaps otherwise as you say they would have been shadowed certainly in coverage by things like Burberry and McQueen yeah um, and it kind of made you realize how far those brands have come in actually not that long a time and how mm. they are now mm. brands that can kind of hold the week. Yeah, it didn't feel like the J.W. Anderson show didn't feel like there was sort of less people there or less. It didn't feel like it had suffered. It felt like, you know, this was still a huge draw and everyone wanted yeah, to Yeah, and go. it felt like a moment. It felt yeah. like a real kind of fashion moment. It was certainly one of the most kind of provocative shows of the week in terms of fashion direction. Mm. 
Um, and it was certainly the one that everybody was talking about, it seemed to me. Yeah. It was the best show for London, I thought, by miles. Mm. Because it felt like a show. Like, when you went into the venue, they'd corridored it all off. So everything was quite claustrophobic. And that kind of led, uh, sort of added a real tension yeah, to it. Yeah, you couldn't see it. other people's reactions no, because you were in such... No, you were in this kind yeah. of... And it's quite difficult to take pictures. And yeah. I think even that kind of awkwardness was, like, reflected by the clothes and the whole kind of feeling of intensity and actually sort of to me felt like the first bit of the weekend where I was like oh what's happened what, what am I looking at yeah and um there's so much to unpick in it but it was also really smart because it felt to me like he had grown up too like even though there were lots of very um fashiony things on the catwalk like crowns and goggles and all of that actually there was lots of really good product in it as well mm, like was... really strong coats really strong bomb jackets mm. um i don't know it just kind of felt like there was a lot to sort of pick out from that yeah and i think the fact that you know he's been working against sort of crossing not sort of moving away from boundaries but and also just the way that he expresses now it, it had grown up in a, mm. in a in a different way it was just a in not mature collection but it was just you know there was some really standout pieces within there that you could really start to edit as a from a buying perspective yeah. as well mm. Mm. What was what's your? Take? I was just going to say <laughs> there was there were two jacket three jackets actually the opening red trench a really amazing um, cropped like Harrington with like a multicolored stripe waistband mm. and a purple bomber jacket that were like just perfect mm. wardrobe staples mm. yeah and you'd never have imagined you'd see that on a JW Anderson yeah. yeah but it but in a kind of weird contrasting way it really worked and mm. I think that was kind of the strength of this as well but it kind of was everything that he's been doing distilled into one like yeah. wearable pieces more directional pieces um great accessories he's very good at referencing himself which i really like yeah. i think it's really interesting when um when designers do that um and i also think his spirit it's, it's interesting that this kind of um eclecticism that we're seeing and obviously like very much a gucci thing but you're seeing it a lot in london this kind of like magpie spirit I wonder if that is kind of running in tandem with these conversations we're having about sort of how fashion week is going to work, but also how the fashion system is going to work and how buyers are working, you know, whether everything is seasonal still or how it's sold. Do you think this kind of cluttered, eclectic thing, it feels very unseasonal to me because if you yeah. do something that's that rich, it tends to work because, you know, it, it's not like a singular statement. Um, do you think that feeds through in how pe into people how, how people are buying things? Um, that they don't want to necessarily buy something that's seasonal, they want to be able to buy, yeah. continually buy into a label? It, definitely, I think, and, and the more and more, but the, the, it's interesting to see how brands will be able to do that because of structure. Yeah. So Burberry can do that buy now, wear now pretty easily. You know, it's yeah. a massive business, they can deliver that. Um, JW probably can, but some of those other guys can't. So because we live in this kind of insta world where everything you have to have it and you've got to yeah. see it and you've got to and you could just get all this information coming in people do want that so yeah. i think that's where the kind of the, the next steps will come but it's yeah. it, it's a huge thing for those brands to do that well it's quite scary isn't it as you say for the young designers because often their work is the most sort of reactionary and it feels very much like it's about the times and it's very you know culturally yeah. driven but then it, it, need, it exists in this thing where they probably are never going to be able to make that instant. And Do you think the cultural side of it is about now, though, rather than, you know, so, so they're, they're talking about a time that's happening right within, you know, mm. they're, they're, they're mixing it at that moment rather than waiting for six months. You know, sometimes, sometimes when you're waiting for something to come in, in you know, four or yeah. five months, it isn't actually that relevant anymore yeah. from that moment. And I wonder yeah. how that sits within collections as well. Yeah. Did you guys feel that at the moment? What's I think design is honestly just need to kind of work out what's going to work for them I think certainly for Burberry you know what they create essentially is product you know they there's a fashion direction in what they do but they create very good outerwear very good knitwear very good, it's kind of quite category driven product whereas some of the younger or not even some of the younger brands a lot of the brands it's a lot more about process and and the craft yeah. and how things are made and actually the fact is that you can't speed up that supply chain anymore if something's being hand embroidered or laser cut or I don't know, welded. Then you can't um, you can't do that any faster without compromising on the quality of it. So I think designers need to just. It seemed to me as though those Burberry kind of took this stance, which I thought was the right stance for them to take as a brand. And then a lot of brands start sort of jumping on bandwagons. And then, oh, we'll do it yeah. too. We'll do this. Yeah. We'll release this handbag. We'll do this three-piece capsule collection. Yeah. Da -da 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 -da. And actually, if it's not relevant for you as a brand and what your story is mm -hmm. and your product, what your production is, then. You, sh you kind of have to have the confidence to say, actually, 
we believe that people will wait six months for our product yeah. because it's a really amazing product. Or refuse to even kind of work in that six month system. I think that's a that's the bigger thing. I feel like Burberry have almost taken a tiny step, but actually the point that brands need to get to is maybe where we don't have autumn, winter and spring, summer, which is obviously what, what they've done with having like collection one and collection two or February and September, whatever it's called. Um, but like, should we even be having two fashion weeks a year? Should people even be doing like two main collections and then these kind of middle collections, you know, should it be a constant drip of product? I, I think that's what's more interesting is kind of seeing how things are, are, are really going to move forward. And, that, and it is strange being, I think it was a really strange fashion week for, for those reasons, all those changes in fashion, but there's so many changes, like, you know, it's kind of, I don't want to talk too much about Brexit because we, we all have breakfast before and we're like, don't talk about Brexit. But like, <laughs> I do think that's a, a big a big thing as well. It feels like there's so much change in fashion and there's going to have, and Brexit is going to have a huge effect on, on young designers. And it is going to be really interesting over the next like two to three years to see how completely this changes. There's, there's Charlie Porter wrote a really good piece that I want to ask you all about where he, um, he talks about how menswear is doing so well, but the men's show system seems to be so under threat, particularly because so many brands are moving to show in a genderless way, which means they probably will show in the Women's Week because there's more press there. And he wrote, menswear is booming. According to Euromonitor International, the global market for men's designer apparel is pro projected to reach 33 billion in 2020, up 14% from 2015, and yet the men's show system is falling apart. What does everyone make of that? Do they kind of agree? Simon, you looked a bit cynical. No, no, and I, I mean, I think it's obviously, I think we all felt that kind of uncertainty yeah. from London through. I mean, actually not so much in Paris because Paris was packed and there was lots of things going on. But I mean, Milan was a very thinned out experience this time. There was no Bottega show. But it was the last time Gucci was showing during the men's season. Um, you know, it didn't feel as dynamic either. And I think that... There was definitely, I mean, everybody was talking about that. What's going to happen if Prada pull the plug, Milan will, like, collapse? Like, you know, yeah. w there was a lot of that chatter. And, you know, obviously every fashion week, there is always a story that is running parallel to the collections, which everyone's talking about. And that was that one coupled with Brexit this season. And it's totally weird to anyone that works in menswear that we're at probably the best point that menswear's ever been at in terms of sales and coverage and people just being enthusiastic about it, mm -hmm. newness coming through, big brands still making sure that they're like pushing what they want to do in terms mm -hmm. of interesting conversations. Um, so yeah, it does seem kind of weird that we've mm -hmm. gone to this position where we're a bit like, oh, or is there gonna be a Milan next season? Is that the ultimate sign is that there... we just don't need shows anymore? Like I feel like it is, or do you think it is? I, no, I don't. I don't. I don't know what I think. <laughs> you, you just think, you know. Sometimes, you know, whatever you're going to get three a season, most probably one if you're lucky, two per city. That are just magical, and you mm. go there, and it's just wow. Okay, that was pretty out there, you know. And, and you get all the references. I can do that, or whatever. But you know, it's just something about a time and a place and an energy that all happens. So we can't lose that. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, it's a creative you know, art. So yeah. you can't make it all kind of based on sort of, you know, looking at it through a screen. You kind yeah. of need some physicality to yeah. it. But it's just about how we do that. So, and I think it must be, it's a super strain on some of these brands to try to create a show or a presentation. So actually easing off of that is going to be a lot easier yeah. for some of them to actually survive. Um, but it's about how, you know, as an industry, we help brands show and how yeah. we want it as well because there's you know the department stores and sh shops are only just getting their head around sort of pre-main seasons mm -hmm. and all the kind of practicalities but you know if you if you forget shows and showroom you know you still need to go to a showroom you still need mm -hmm. to buy fashion pieces because people want to see them mm -hmm. um i suppose this becomes it's like a tom brown situation mm -hmm. this becomes more theater this becomes more art mm -hmm. um and then that is a probably a really positive thing. But it's I think around that is, the timing. But then you think it should be consumer facing then. I think that's I agree that you need these happenings. Um but I just I'm not sure it, like it, it did feel a little bit this fashion week, like I think I was feeling particularly cynical this fashion week because of Brexit, but like it did feel a little bit like everyone was kind of shouting into an echo chamber, you know, and I wonder how much it is getting back to a consumer. I don't know. Would, like, I think I was just gonna say I think it goes back to what Rob said, that it's what's right for the brand. If they yeah. like some brands don't need to do a catwalk. They don't even need to do a presentation. They don't. They don't need it. They feel a need to take part in fashion week, mm. and sometimes to their detriment. Whereas yeah. other brands really excel on a catwalk, like like JW. Like that yeah. that whole experience, the claustrophobia, the the sound, the light. That was all part of it, and it mm. added to it. But other people who, you know, cobble together some extra looks to make it into a catwalk show, like 
that can be detrimental, I think. Mm -hmm. And it just goes down to what the brand needs, what their mm -hmm. consumer mm -hmm. might want. But well, I agree with one. you that you that you the brands also need to think about more about the consumer and less about the kind of hundred two hundred people who are sitting in the show, mm. um, because I think with someone like JW, I think it really works because even if you weren't at the show, you see the images, mm. and you you get this sense that this is a this is progressive fashion. So if mm. that's what you're looking for, then you will buy into JW. And even if you're not going to wear you know, a three-quarter length smock, you might then just buy the T-shirt, but you feel like you're buying into that world. Yeah. Um, and I think the brands could probably be canny about how they present their collections and how they balance showing it to the press and the editors, many of whom are jaded and are probably may not even get it mm. or be interested in it, just how you show it to the consumer, who ultimately is the one who's going to... It's the and the, the consumer's moment. making, not, they've always made their own decisions, but they're making their own decisions right from the offset as well, aren't they? So does yeah. that make that harder from a kind of a press point of view because does that mean that there's less sort of influence or interaction or, or voice that press have when everyone else has already seen it? What I think it will be interesting, I mean it's off on a tangent now, but yeah. when Burberry <laughs> do their, the first consumer facing show and yeah. they cut out all the, the build up that, you know, magazines will shoot a dress and, or a jacket or whatever and make it the dress of the season and then it sells out, whereas that's all gone and it goes from show to sales. But I don't think it has gone, I think it's it's just modernised, like actually yeah, what yeah, I imagine will happen no is that, that Burberry mm. will put their show on their website and then loads of other online outlets will pick it up, there'll be tons of noise around it online mm. and they will get press coverage and they will be focused on things but it, will be, it won't be happening over the course of six months, yeah. it will be happening over the course of an hour mm -hmm. and actually that's, that's the world we live in, like actually mm -hmm. why do we need six months for a, a, a dress to make its journey from a suit to make a journey from a runway show to a consumer. In, 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 like you, there is a way of speeding up if you can do it. Mm, and yeah. actually, you know, customers want instant. Um, I just think customers want to feel involved, don't they? Yeah. And that's what I feel like maybe isn't happening enough right through from the fashion show in the fashion shows to like, you know, the magazines to you, websites how we talk about fashion. I feel like I did have points where I was like, who cares? Like, who is consuming this? Who understands this? And like, it does feel so removed from how people actually consume and how people actually shop. Yeah. And, and it, like, that, that's a kind of interesting side to Do you feel that, like, with someone like Matches, like, you, you know, the things that we talk about as a fashion person and then the way that people shop is so different? Or is uh, that gap getting closer as menswear becomes more? Well, I think the interesting thing is that you know, what you're seeing is that there is a strong men's consumer who is buying runway fashion. Mm -hmm. So the reality is that however they are presenting it, it is working. People mm -hmm. want the Gucci runway snaky, jumpery thing. Um, and um, obviously we have interest through the content about the younger designers. People want to read interviews with the younger designers and we've always supported that. Um, but I think it does go back to this very notion that as we live in a world which is changing all the time and it's instant and all the rest of it, it is a situation where people want fashion every day. They don't just want it through the show season. So it's about working out how you pepper that throughout the, the whole year as a, as a business, mm -hmm. as a brand. And I, I think it's totally true that for I personally still don't need a, to buy that thing just because I've seen it that second. And actually I think a lot of people will realise that the savvier purchase is the one that they think about a bit longer. Mm. So I think it'll be very interesting to see what happens with Burberry. And I think that they ha obviously have a very particular way of selling products and they've done it before, so they have an, a kind of sense of how that will work. But I think that, you know, we can all get very caught up in the idea that we want everything right this second. But do we really? Like, mm. every time I've ever ordered something quite whimishly after a show, I've always got it six months later and thought, oh God, why did I order that? Yeah. I should have got that you know yeah, it's like yeah. um so I, I don't know i think we have to there's a lot of things that we have to kind of wait and see i understand what you're saying about the idea of the shows are, is it modern anymore da, 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 da. but i think from from a certain brand perspective the process of putting together a collection putting the music together da, 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 that all of that is part of driving forward some kind of narrative that makes buzz around a brand and that from a creative point of view, yeah. makes us care about fashion. Like, you know, you've got to have those things that make you go, mm. Mm. Do you think that then from that, it creates more desire by getting 
the accessibility of some of the show at that point. So you can be whimsical, like you were just yeah. talking about, and you go on a whim yeah. and go, okay, I'm going to buy that now. Yeah. And then in six months' time, when you've had more time to think about it, you go, actually, that piece was great, and that's coming in yeah. there. So do you think it's actually going to help the brands to kind of continue a pace of selling throughout? But maybe it's about having a bit of both. Bit like, of both. you know, yeah, I think yeah, there was a, yeah. I think Coach, and there was, I was reading something about Coach, and they, they tried selling one handbag after a show yeah. for women's wear, and apparently it sold out completely. Prada did that as well, they sold two different handbags. It, yeah, they yeah. did, So yeah. maybe it's just a question of the balance, but it doesn't answer the question which you originally posed, which is what does it mean about consumer? Yeah. Like, should the consumer be more involved? But I do think it's interesting what Rob said about how the, the show works for, sorry, I keep going back to J.W. Anderson. <laughs> <laughs> But I think what's interesting is how he does it because there is this show that exists, you know, as you say, I think it seduces the people who just buy a t shirt or what have you and they feel like they're buying into this world. But he, I think, better than anyone, has, you know, with the means he has, is very good at doing these like constant happenings. You know, he started doing those workshops at his right. um, shop in East London. He started doing, like, he did that little capsule with ASAP Rocky, like, he did the capsule mm. with Larry Clark. Yeah. Like, he's very good at, at having these two shows almost like his sort of corner. Stones and like you know they're, they're the bookends of of um, of his aesthetic mm. for that year, but then he's always got some kind of thing going so on. And he talks, you know, a, lot. Yeah. he talks yeah. a lot. He talks a lot to yeah, the yeah. press. Like he's yeah. not a quiet designer. He's always doing interviews. He's very like there. They did, they streamed the last one before this on Grinder. I mean, yeah. you know, I think he's kind of savvy about that, yeah. and that's quite modern. And so you always feel like you're seeing something new with him. Like you know, he did the Macintosh collaborate and all of that. Like it's. I think that's maybe the way to go. Is feeling like there's constantly something but going isn't on. Isn't that? already happening because you can't do much at, you, 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 even you know from a trading perspective you've got to do that in the store yeah. um, and you have to keep having a reason to come back and reason and it's the yeah. same with him he's talking he's enjoying doing that yeah. his customers and his, his audience want to hear him and he's looking and he is probably being is making him be more creative as well because yeah. he can do more yeah. with the flexibility yes he's got some backing but you know the actual you know so that's that's a really it's you know it's a very modern perspective of a brand and, yeah. it, and it really is but it's also quite an old school way because yeah. i think we've always done that it's just we've just got a much much more opportunity to work with different sort of you know media yeah so that's brilliant i think the modern thing for me about how he does it is that like um sort of curator thing that he does you know from picking like the people that he's going to do a collaboration with or like you know suddenly he's doing something about you know ceramics and all of that like he's yeah. very good at doing that and and i wanted to talk about collaboration actually in both in his context because of the asap rocky thing but also because it was like the season of collaboration like goshua did those six or seven i can't remember mm. Um, in pity, he did. What, the collaborations? Yeah. He didn't did. he have over 20? It was crazy. Yeah, that might have had loads. Oh, the yeah, Bethlehem yeah, yeah, did like, like 27 or something. Yeah, yeah so Gosha. Um, and then yeah. Gosha did that. And, and I'm interested, I also want to yeah. talk about that because that, that feels like something that has always been a very London thing. You know, we always talk about London as the city of sharing and, you know, teamwork. But it feels like that feels really, really current and contemporary. But those brands do feel quite London, you know, yeah, so I think they, even though they're not at all. Yeah. And, um, but they, they, well, they are. Way, like Gosha was fashionista. Yeah, really, like, exactly. So, um, yeah, that's true. Yeah, so we kind of think, but yeah, amazing, you know, what those brands are doing, you know, that also, especially on Gosha, the price point that he achieved and gets mm. it at, that just makes it mm. really accessible. Yeah. And the way that he kind of works it and does it and makes it completely relevant to, you know, a, a new audience. Yeah. You know, it's quite, it's kind of redefining something. Yeah. And it's, a bit, it's a bit like a J.W. Anderson yeah. as well, isn't it? Because he's collaborating with the brands that he knows are speaking to his customer. Yeah. He cast the show through Instagram. He's a photographer, so he released a book. Like, it's that... 360. I hate yeah. this terminology, yeah. but like it's from Paris. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's, yeah. it's that whole experience. Experience. And do you think that? Do you think that that is what a customer wants? They want to feel like they're buying into a world. Because I feel like we went through a period maybe when e-commerce first started, where it was all about product, 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 and it was very much like about stuff. And now we're we moving back to something where you feel like you want to you want more from your clothes. You want it to be like you know a signal of who you are as a person. And I like, think people. I like the idea of authenticity maybe more now than they have done. I think maybe that's just because of the world that we live in and and social media and Instagram and, and how everything can feel very kind of surface. I think even if things aren't particularly authentic, there's a certain kind of rush for brands that feel as if they're doing something that mm -hmm. feels true to who they are, which I think is why people like Gosha and Vetmore have done extremely well, is because you believe the story, like you believe that this is something that Gosher is pulling from his own narrative and it's not yeah. just something he's mm -hmm. plucked out of the air or off Instagram that he's seen and liked. Um, and yeah, I think that's something that other brands could learn from is, the idea, is actually thinking about what can you personally bring. Mm. And I think that's what some of the cleverer designs in London did. I think people like Kottweiler 
and Peter yeah. were really smart about. They weren't trying to go, oh, this season we're going to do cowboys and space and Bowie. Yeah, no. Like they just, they, they went to what they know and they talked mm. about their own subculture, which for both of those designers was gay subculture mm. and explored that. And that's their world. And mm. it felt like, okay, I actually, I'll buy into this because mm. I believe this. It's interesting that you it's mentioned yeah. Peter and gay, and gay subculture because it does feel like, obviously, like Maplethorpe had the RAF moment in pity, so it did kind of feel like it was slightly like, you know, gay culture was having a moment in fashion, which is like the biggest irony ever because fashion is <laughs> yeah. like, basically is gay culture. Um, but what but what do we think of um, of designers? Dr- like, also, I was thinking about it as like as an active consumer group, like of, to build a fashion label that is targeted at gay men and a particular lifestyle group. This is very much about, you know, like the body and the health thing. And like, is there a consumer group for that that's maybe been ignored before? But do you not think this is more, uh, it's a little bit, uh, it's not actually that because yes, it's appealing <laughs> towards gay, you know, a, a, a customer or, you know, or, or to the, but it's also, but we've just been going through two or three seasons where actually it doesn't matter, gay, straight, whatever. Yeah. It's just all the same and it's appealing to, you know, if someone likes fashion and they're interested yeah. in the brand, then they'll buy into those pieces. And I think, you know, there's, there's such a, you know, the divide is, you know, there isn't there really sort of these set camps. But I, that's what I find interesting about this because I agree with you. I feel like yeah. that like androgyny and that like fluidity has been having such a moment. So and then like, I yeah. feel like this is kind of quite forcefully against that. Like a lot of like the slogans, you know, he does a lot of wording. Um, they 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 are quite exclusive. Like they're often mm. phrases that are taken from Grinder or from like right. you know gay sort of communication like it, through apps and that. Kind of, so that it's very much against that. Like this is for everyone thing. It's like no, it's not. Really it's refreshing. For, yeah, yeah. So yeah. But then Ronaldo would wear that middle look. You know, he likes to <laughs> yeah, see that. Is so, really, yeah, that so, is so, true. Yeah, that is true. I think that's yeah. what's so good yeah, about so. this is that yeah. it's kind of a wink and a nudge to people that get it. Like, yeah. yeah. Like the fun now jumper. Yeah. Like a couple of seasons ago. That's a fine jumper, but if you get it, you're yeah. kind of like you know, like you yeah. know that I know that you, and it's. I think that's what's good about it is yeah. that it's kind of if you want to buy into that because of that, you can, or you can just buy like a great shirt. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's not silly. No, like it's no, not. It's not. not, it's not at all. But it's yeah. also no, it's not it's, it's that all those in jokes are surrounded by very wearable clothes. Exactly. Mm. So it's smart. It's like it's it's kind of for anyone. Mm. What I really liked about it was that it actually felt of today like I think you see so many collections actually especially this season where they talk about subculture and counterculture but they're these kind of dead countercultures like Mm -hmm. punk or mod or Mm -hmm. skinheads and you think those are kind of dead movements that have not existed for a a long time or certainly not in any real way but there's this weird nostalgia for them Mm -hmm. and actually this is what our counterculture or subculture is today is is this kind of underbelly of Mm -hmm. of the gay world and Mm -hmm. grinder and chemsex and all of that and actually that is kind of uncomfortable and there's a tension there, but that's really interesting and it's mm. something that like designers are very, really clever to explore. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I think you're right. I think with that, it, it, is, it is very interesting that it feels like, I think it was an incredibly nostalgic season. It's interesting, it, it's the 40th anniversary of punk, so like punk was having this kind of like moment across the runways. But I think what's interesting with this is it engages like, with all aspects of modern living from sex right through to sort of online and how people communicate and and that's fascinating because as you say there's there's few designers that get that right i think but then i wonder do you do you also think what's interesting about this is like i'm fascinated by the man that it champions because we talk so much about the skinny slim boy which obviously had such a moment because of eddie simone at saint laurent but i think what's interesting with this is it almost taps into that other like huge trend at the moment which is like health and healthy eating yeah. and like mm. caring about your body and i actually think you know the person who's willing to spend like six pounds on like you know more than that like 12 pounds on jews is probably someone who does have the disposable income to buy high fashion but it feels like high fashion has never acknowledged that like healthy lifestyle thing and this is very much about that you know it's a guy who's built and muscly and probably does go to the gym and i don't know how much he's been addressed in fashion i think it swings on a pendulum i think if you think of the early noughties and dolce and versace yeah, and the say. kind of milan yeah. moment it was well, all about hunts and trunks yeah, exactly. yeah. 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 it was big calvin ticks this box yeah calvin yeah, does, yeah. and so does Givenchy. the shapes yes, at Givenchy are true. very gym body focused yeah. to me yeah. everything that um, ricardo does has that kind of you know, Merton Marcus, we've got quite good abs and all that jazz. Yeah. So I don't know about that. I, I think thought that you said I, all that jazz. All that jazz. <laughs> <laughs> Jazzy abs. Yeah, exactly. I just think but, that we've got more diversity in menswear than we ever have, which is yeah. what we said like kind of at the beginning. Yeah. Um, and which is why, you know, it's we're all talking about the future of it because actually at this point in time, it's, gr- it's great that you can have this on the same 
schedule as you know um, a tailoring brand but it, it goes back to that very initial question about what does London mean yeah and I think this ties in really well to, to Cotweiler which I thought was one of the best yeah. shows of on London as well because yeah. actually I think we talked about this afterwards it was kind of sexy mm. yeah and it like yeah. it was really clever because it was like it felt like a show and it felt like it you know you went up these like back stairs and they it's quite funny like we were walking up the back and there's like a tro- like a trolley with towels on it yeah. and I was like is this like a series of clues but everyone was like being really snobby they were like ha 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 an installation and then it actually yeah. was it, like, yeah oh. and then it actually was like totally about you know these characters and, yeah. and and it kind of you know the whole thing was like uh, it, it was really clever because it was modern cause it, and, and sexy and all of those things but also it was about sportswear which is what men are buying and wearing in tracksuits mm. and mm. but like these yeah. guys are like they just won the Walmart um, uh, British nominee section so they'll go yeah. through to the final like and you know well. they were talking <laughs> about very passionately about fabrication and, yeah. and how they develop the, the things so it's like it's modern in lots of ways. That it was a really modern show. The clothes were modern, and their work is is very much about these kinds of modern fabrics. Mm. It's really smart. Mm. I also think it's really interesting that you use the word sexy because I do think there was a lot of like sexiness happening, um, particularly in London. But it is a different kind of sexy to that hunks and trunks thing. Mm. I agree that's it's a similar a bit body, grubby, but, in kind but it's of kind of grubby. Ways. You're right. Yeah. It's, a, it's different. It's not like it's not hetero, and it's not kind of like. Well, it's not so thing. Italian polished exactly or, or gigolo style yeah. it's a little bit more real than that it's still polished but yeah. uh, it's just got a different it's got more of a sort of like London feel to it yeah. it feels more accessible though I think I think I find the real, kind, of, real. The kind yeah. of like hunky Italian thing quite alienating and intimidating because you know I'm, I'm not you know at the gym every day so I don't I'm not going to go out I'm not going to go out in like a silk <laughs> shirt and a pair of speedos so that's you know I'm not I'm not that customer oh, yeah. but actually <laughs> that would be terrifying <laughs> but actually the things like Kottweiler and Peter they're it's kind of a, a sex list it's based on the reality of how men are and it's yeah. not this yeah. kind of idealised masculinity there's something quite kind of I know what you mean it. but it's very different to like a J.W. Anderson, isn't it? Where it's like, I think J.W. Anderson is like, people always talk about it being about sex and fetish and, you know, like taboos and stuff, but something like J.W. Anderson is so unsexy to me. It's quite, it can be like a little bit flirtatious, but it's quite foppish, it's very fey. It's, it's not, not sexy like, like this. I think no. it's a different, yeah, I think it's, it's like aesthetic, aesthetic yeah. perversity yeah. rather than sexual perversity. Like yeah. the J.W. thing works because it's things that shouldn't go together and you kind of go, ooh, like, do yeah. I like that? Yeah. Oh, maybe I do like that. It's quite child, quite like willfully child. Like they even played like Peter and the Wolf. But even if you think of those frills, it is like there is that weird like sick. Kind of, it's a bit me mewy in that sense. You've got that, like, that childy. Yeah. What, what's that? Yeah, and you're like that's weird. It mm. looks like a like. I often think his models, particularly, it comes through in the casting as well. But they they look very young. They look like boys, and it is very. Um, it's interesting to contrast that with with this other movement where you, you think they look like any more boys. like boys than a lot of other shows look like boys. I mean, all the models are quite young anyway. I just think that it's a slightly different body shape. But I think shape. he makes them look quite fragile. You know, like the crowns and then last season there was like the feathers no, and the I'm sheer. Not, I think the goggles were quite hardcore. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna be combining oh. them with a Peter outfit <laughs> and being out and about. On I'm just gonna walk around holding towels. <laughs> Ready. And yeah. there's a lot of shades that we haven't we haven't talked about. I would like to talk about Nazir because it's right. interesting to talk about the Nazir in the context of um, Nazir Matar, sorry, in the context of all the conversations we were having at the start about. Um, firstly, we're talking about modernity, but also like changing your show season because Nazir obviously has completely kind of flipped things around. He's not going to be wholesaling uh, apart from to sort of one or two people. He's going to be selling through his own site and. Um, and kind of remodeled his business and has been very outspoken in some interviews about like you know. The demands that were put on him and the state of the industry and what have you um, and and it's interesting also that he has such a sort of specific following and you see them at his shows but he seems to sit so outside of fashion in some ways as well like it's it's its own I, I know he hates the word tribe but it's its own thing and, and are we seeing that the most successful brands moment, that's actually what they're building these little worlds around like Cotweiler also kind of have that like there's mm. kids that are like obsessed with it I think that's how they're going to survive by doing yeah. that he's been you know super sensible it's obviously you know gone right okay how am I going to do this I've got a great following I bring them to me yeah. I probably just need to pick one or two other stores in the world that yeah. I can work with that can give me a different profile or a different sort of you know you know to different group of people but otherwise everyone can come and I can sort it out and yeah. I get now I'm I, I'm in control I'm doing yeah. something well yeah so I think that's actually quite you know 
it's quite a refreshing way to look at it. Yeah. Yeah, I think the designers are smart to find a model yeah. that works for them. I think often the complaint you hear from young designers is that they have a vision of their brand and then that vision is completely diluted by by stores essentially. Yeah. Because they make their selection and they may just pick the most commercial kind of tame pieces which don't really tell the story of what the brand is. Yeah. Um, so I think designers are quite clever if they can if they could able to to react against that and say, actually, this is who I am and this is what I want to do and I'm not going to you know, we can dilute myself for the sake of anyone else. Yeah. But do you think, do, like, do you think it is actually a, a maintainable model? Like, it feels like young designers, like, which is, it feels like they're kind of here and everything is here. Like, they're up against so much. Like, you know, like, you see it with, like, I see it when we, we go to a showroom together. Like, young designers are, like, falling over themselves to be stopped by, like, a multi-brand retailer. You know, they don't have that confidence to think... I don't need this, you know. <laughs> because I think, like you said, yeah, it's, it's what everyone's been used to doing. So, mm -hmm. thanks. Um, whereas it's, you know, doing it yourself and knowing that you can do it and you've got the traffic and you've mm -hmm. got this new fan base as well as a customer base, that, that's, yeah, that's exciting. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. great. Yeah, yeah. And what do we think about the aesthetic of the show? Because it was also an interesting season where a lot of people who've traditionally done very kind of sporty styles kind of moved away from that. Like, I keep talking about Gosha, which I shouldn't because it was a pity. But the fact that he opened with suits, mm -hmm. like, Oh, is there? Oh, have we reached like peak tracksuits, and now we're moving on from that? What's well, the new thing? I don't think. I with Gosha, that's kind of like he's got a culture, and he's referencing like a pack tribal m movement. The other yeah. tracksuit, you know, they've yeah. kind of never really, you know, they're, they're, you know, they've never really come out of tracksuits. Yeah. But so he embraces that. But he's also like, actually, you know, there's a suit involved as well because yeah. you know maybe some boring stuff. He's got to go to work or whatever. So yeah. it's quite, it's quite interesting because it's it's not about that. It's about yeah. freedom and expressing something in a very small way, localized. Yeah. But he's actually putting some sort of strange dynamic or a twist on it. And I yeah. thought, okay, that's interesting. Raph's done it before, hasn't he? Yeah. Everyone thought you know Raph did some of the best street, and then all of a sudden he did a collection. He just did suits with yeah. neoprene arms, but they were suits. Yeah. Um, and he just sort of threw it around a bit, and so mm. they're just embracing that. I so. think it goes back to the authenticity thing as well I think we're not bored of sportswear but what's become boring is yeah. these brands who don't know anything about sportswear trying to do sportswear yeah, like, yeah. you know big luxury houses going oh we'll do tracksuits and backpacks because the kids like them and it's and, mm. and it's just you can see right through it and it feels really kind of yeah. whereas Nazir that's his language that's what he's done that's what he's built his brand on is is a, a twisted take on sportswear mm. so for him to suddenly go oh well everybody else is re-exploring tailoring so I'm going to do a double-breasted suit would make no sense for him and, mm. and would alienate his, his customer. Mm. Also, I think the thing with Gosha doing suits was like a really smart, clever mm -hmm. wink to pity. Like, mm. Yeah. And it was also that whole, like, it was the culture. Italian brand, so yeah. Italian, like, it was all yeah. that. Yeah. Kind yeah. Of pity peacocks, mm. yeah. three piece suits, and what have you. kind of. Exactly. But talking, yeah. we are talking about tailoring, so I'd like to talk about um, Grace Wells Bonner because she's a really interesting character on the London scene, which she has an aesthetic that seems very removed from what everyone else is doing, and it's very, very her. Um, and she's interesting at the moment, obviously, because she's working with Brioni as well um, and helping kind of consult for them, which is so very much kind of established herself as like a cool young tailoring girl. In the same way, actually, that Charles Jeffrey has as well, which is interesting to think of like the young talents focusing on that. What do we all think of Grace's show and why the phenomenon around Grace? I think it's quite awesome. I think it's you know, what she's doing. I think it's just, I, I think it's just got a little bit of magic that kind of comes through. It's yeah. obviously something that sort of stands out. But it's um, yeah, you're right. So there's any this kind of the sort of in the last couple of seasons that really kind of gathered momentum. Mm. I didn't realise she was doing some stuff with Bruni. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think yeah. she's another one who's just pulling from something that's really honest. Yeah. Like she's yeah. not authentic. she's not jumping on bandwagons and she's not thinking about the market. She's going, this is who I am. This is what I'm interested in as an artist or designer. And if you like it, then that's great. But she's also incredibly protective of her brand, which I think is really smart. Mm -hmm. Like she's not selling to stores. There's stores who want to work with her who they're saying no to. And you know, she's not desperate to be in every magazine. No. She's she's kind of guarding it and saying this is deliberately quite a niche thing, mm -hmm. and it makes you want to be a part of it. So, you yeah, know, which you is always exactly want to go to the party doing. that you're not invited to. Like, yeah, yeah. So you, you kind of want to be buy into her world because you kind of can't, you can't really access it. Yeah, I think that's yeah. really canny. And it also has a really, like, a very clear narrative too that she works on, and that seems very important to her, the story that goes around it. And I think fashion with a story can often feel more authentic. And also, you know, it's important for her in terms of this early on in her career not to burst. So by keeping that kind of clever sort of pace of momentum and not kind of just veering off onto different tangents is very clever. I mean, it was... 
such a beautiful collection in terms of the way in which it was set, like it was very poetic and the tailoring was beautiful. Mm. I, mean, I actually didn't, I didn't personally like it as much as the one before, yeah. but that, that's just a very personal thing. Um, I was like obsessed with the one before, yeah. like, you know, completely. And I think it would probably would have been impossible to, for me to have liked an, any um, show of hers more than the one before. But you know, it's, there are becoming those little trademark things within each collection that she does, these little short jackets. And this one was leather with like a, you know, a contrast collar. And um, I think she's very interesting, and I think that, you know, there's obviously something happening in young designers being interested in tailoring again. Mm. I think yeah. it's just a reaction to what we just spoke about. Yeah. And I think that's why we yeah. maybe we're drawn to it as well, because mm. you are, if we are reaching peak tracksuit, then when you see a beautifully tailored suit, you're kind mm. of like, well, that's kind of, but it's different to kind of the tailoring brands that mm. we're all used to. So I think that's yeah. It's di it feels more anti in a way than wearing like a tracksuit. You yeah. know, when you see someone just wearing a really like kind of like neat plain suit with like sneakers, it does look better than. I think I think it's also like the street style thing as well. I think we've kind of reached like that streetwear thing, which was supposed to be so much about relaxation and, as Rob says, like authenticity and like almost like calm and being very like at peace with your wardrobe has somehow got wrapped up in being like trying incredibly hard and being wearing these kind of and, and those images are so pervasive I think we forget actually talking about the fashion bubble I think street style is one of the things that does completely transcend the fashion bubble and you yeah, see yeah. it across magazines and I think it's huge that's why people it's become such an industry because it's something that does genuinely draw in a, um, a, someone outside of fashion but streetwear has just kind of dominated that to the point where I don't think it feels that fresh anymore it doesn't at all. I suppose that's really interesting. You you mentioned Brioni as well, but how that has come about. Mm -hmm. So from a street style person that's gone in and isn't street style yet, to suppose a suit, and then has gone in to be a creative director, but then pulling in all these different kind of. And I suppose you know, it, it, tailoring brands. What are they going to do? Because they yeah. can't be the same. Yeah. They need to adapt as well. It needs yeah. to have a sort of slightly softer aesthetic. Yeah. But then I, I, I think there's a couple of good sort of um, UK brands and. There's some good stuff out of sort of Naples, Milan that have got the more soft tailoring vibe going on as well. Yeah. So that's interesting because you can kind of mix that back in with a piece with a, with a gosher t-shirt and yeah. the whatever. Yeah. But um, yeah, I think that's important. I think that's yeah, kind of so to to make tailoring because it's such an amazing skill and it's kind of dying off a bit. But yeah. um, they're kind of bringing it back in a new way. So that's that's fresh. What do we think? Sorry, go ahead. Uh, just on the suit thing, I just think it's also about making a suit that feels like something that you want to wear. I mean, you know, it's kind of interesting, like often when you're talking to people that work in the industry that are dressed quite casually, they're often when you talk about seating, they're like, well, I would wear a suit if it was comfortable. And they feel constricted in it. Yeah. It's really interesting when, with Balenciaga in Paris, like that show with all the really shrunken jackets, and I tried one on in the showroom. Yeah. And There's a picture on my it, Instagram if people would like but to see. It's kind of funny because it's really shrunken, but when I put it on, it felt kind of amazing. Really comfy, yeah. And I thought, oh my God, I would actually consider wearing this mm. jacket. And I haven't wanted to wear a suit jacket yeah. ever, really. Yeah. Um, so I want to see the picture now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, slightly gurney. Yeah, you're gurney. You're doing the blend. Um, but just, there's something. It's it's the construction yeah. is so clever yeah. that it that it doesn't. It feels light. Yeah. But it it feels like you're wearing it, but it's not like I okay. didn't have that feeling of like constriction. Mm. It's kind of weird. Which it was. Which one? It's a little checky one. One of the really small ones. Um, should we talk about Charles Jeffrey? Well, yeah, that one. No, no. Should we talk about Charles Jeffrey while we are talking about tailoring? Because I think Charles has kind of spreads this, where he kind of treads between these two things where people often talk about Love Boy very much like it's so like he showed as part of the man show. Yeah. People um, talk about it like it's all about club kids. Um, but then they, on the other hand, they also talk about it like it's part of this tailoring thing. So it kind of speaks to these two different worlds. Um, and I think what was particularly interesting this season is it feels like he's very much trying to move away from that club kid thing. And this was very head back compared to what he usually does much less colour it's very much about construction and like almost like um, pulling it right back to the, those kind of suit pieces um, I felt it was people there was so much last season that felt very like collage and found and stuck yeah. together almost and this met, I personally found this was his way of saying like if people kind of criticise that this is his way of saying like I can make an amazing jacket I yeah can, I can make clothes I can yeah exactly yeah I know what you mean I wonder if people would think of him more as like a stylist and pulling things together and this was very much I wonder why it's captured people's imagination so much because I always 
like London and club culture, it's not new, you know, like no, it's just that no. endless joke where people are like, I saw it the first time, you know, I was yeah. there with Lee Barry. And and this very much is of that ilk, you know, and like draws on those on those um on those heroes, whether deliberately or like subconsciously. So what is it about Charles's work that's is it tied to the fact that so many clubs are closing and there's not as much like what is it? I think it's partly that I think it's a bit of an escapist thing. I think the world is so dreadfully dreary and depressing at the moment that actually seeing somebody which is why I actually preferred last season to this season because it felt really joyful and fun and a bit anarchic and and it and sort of like oh well fuck it let's just go and go to the club and get really wasted and dance mm. all night because everything's terrible um, and I thought that's what came across in a lot of shows this season I thought Shannon was the same I thought Sibling was the same which actually you know optimism and fun is re- has mm. been really not on the fashion agenda mm. for a long time it's all become quite serious um, and and quite was, lofty. And quite lofty yeah. and quite kind of st- st- struggling to tell you how clever it is and what its references are. Whereas I think what Charles Jeffrey did last season, which is why I really loved it, was because it was just a laugh. Mm. And, you know, there were obviously some references in there, but actually you also just thought, that's a really cool jumper and it was just cool kids. Yeah. So I thought there was an element of that in this one too, where it felt like, you know, there was that kind of escapism thing and it did feel like it was taking you away from everything. Mm. Um... But yeah, then there was this kind of weird, slightly like, gothic, moodier element mm. as well. So Let's talk about Sibling while you mention it, because Sibling was like... Um, so much fun. <laughs> so much fun. I think we should say the opening model that you're seeing um, came out with the towel that he's holding wrapped around him and then did a kind of like Bucks Fizz reveal. <laughs> um, Towels are a thing. It's yeah, a big thing, yeah. Towels are a trend. Do they sell yeah. well? Do you sell them on matches? Do you sell them at well, We sell beach ones. Yeah, we do. Yeah. yeah, we do. And do people love a branded towel? Oh, I think it's awesome. Fantasy towels are brilliant. Fantasy towels. Yeah, so yeah it's funny. the way forward. Um, but sibling is such a, like sibling are so loved within sort of like the industry, which is always like there's always a great atmosphere at their shows, um, and like I interviewed um, Joe Bates, who um, was one of the trio of sibling before he he passed away, and he he said something amazing when he said it didn't it doesn't have to be bleak to be deep, and I think that's really like kind of summed up what you were saying there, Rob, and a lot of the mood of London. Um, where things can be as beautifully made and as intelligent and as provocative, but they can also be like really fun and light. And I think there is something that does feel like very almost irreverent and exciting about being that optimistic. It's almost like optimis- optimism is rebellion because, as you say, in times where everyone has to like be so you know proving why they're smart and you're know, proving their and um, like their worth to do something which is like so willfully silly. Mm. Um, that still gets rave reviews is is it, tricky. It I does think. it does have quite a Vivian Westwood vibe though, to it, in elements of it. So Do you think? Bit, I yeah. think it, I always think like Galliano, like Galliano girl. Yeah. yeah, it's kind of like. But it, there, there are a few references to it. Mm. But yeah. then that's out. Everyone was doing the Vivian Westwood. Like Gucci did a yeah exactly. Track. They did like yeah, a no, direct no, exactly. trailer. So. Yeah. Um, and I think that inher- inhabits the same world, which is, the, yeah, you know, it, you can it, things can be a little bit wild and fun and free and they don't have to be so controlled which is what kind of exactly what they stood were. for exactly. and, yeah. and what these brands stand for now I thought um, Rotting Dean Bazaar at Fashion East was the same thing where yeah. Yeah. it was like there's nothing there's no shame in things being fun and loose and and ridiculous like you know that Rotting Dean show Otherwise. had um, fag ash kind of yeah. imprinted into clothes like you know it, it was absurd but in the best way and, it, and actually it was one of the things you really remembered because mm. it was a laugh mm. you know that t-shirt was made out of hair that they'd shaped into Che Guevara like it was just kind of brilliantly weird and when, when you were kind of looking at so many other small presentations and new designers who were so lofty and so kind of couldn't wait to tell you what then was on their mood board it was like oh finally something that's just like like you'd have fun in those clothes. And a lot of it wasn't just clothes as well it was like very much about product design like they'd done those clocks with the cigarettes and stuff and I thought that was really clever because again it's very much like going back to what you're saying about authenticity it felt like this kind of madcap world where they make all this stuff and the fact that they'd the clock was as valid as like the jumper or whatever was quite an interesting way of approaching it um because as you say it doesn't feel like you know a designer sitting there with a mood board and making a perfect jacket and then mm. yeah i thought that was that was strong who like i'm conscious of time but who haven't we, we haven't talked about um we haven't talked about coach we haven't talked about kiko young designer again who is we kind of touched on christopher shannon but i think it's yeah. important to have a look at that show because it was i thought it was one of his best uh, it's, it's interesting what we're saying about authenticity because it's like so him like all of the kind of like menswear roots and influences that he looks at but also kind of like club culture like life up north like all of that sort of came through in there so that was really brilliant is there anyone we've desperately missed we haven't really talked about Craig Green Green yeah yeah should we have a look at the Craig yep. Green show 
Um, I feel bad for Craig Green because I feel like the pressure on him must be absolutely enormous because he's so young and already people are like, like as you were saying, it's like the show in London alongside mm-hmm. I think he seems so unfazed by it though. Yeah. When I went to see him in Paris, he was, he's just so knows what he's doing. Like he's 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 just interested in this core product that he's going to do, which is just workwear. Mm-hmm. And he told me he he was um, his his aim is that you know you think of Gracie, you think of Tom Brown. Yeah. He wants it to be the think of the world, like you think of Craig Green. Yeah. And all the other stuff that happens around the show and around the kind of wackier stuff that you see in the show is important to kind of keep it fresh. But actually, he knows who he is as a designer. So mm. that cause it means the kind of the pressure won't really get to him because he's not going to suddenly go, I need to do something new, I'm going to do space. Like, he's, yeah. he knows who he is as a You're designer. With space. <laughs> I know, I'm trying to like get other designers to do it. <laughs> <laughs> like, it was, I think he's really smart. I think that's the way designers should think now is kind yeah. of what am I good at and what do people want from me? Yeah. And, I'm, and I'm not going to try and be everything to everyone. And do you think it's hard for him though? Because that, like, I think everyone's always like, oh, I expected like a stronger show. Like because it, there's so much consistency to what he does. He's not a seasonal designer, as you say. It is like, kind of often hammering home a similar point. And I feel like it's really hard to kind of do that, which is what everyone actually wants for him. And everyone who's kind of sensible understands he needs to do to grow his brand. But then there's also this desire to kind of go and have this fabulous show where everyone cries and it's a big flag and amazing music. And like, how is he balancing that? I think he's just riding out. I think designers. I mean, press story will will come to realise, and other guests of the show will come to realise that he's not that kind of a designer. So mm. you're not going to get this big wallopy fireworks in moment every time. Mm. And actually, although he had this kind of explosion into the spotlight, he's 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 concentrating on a really slow build of his brand. Mm. And actually, I I suspect that he probably wouldn't mind if some of the limelight comes off him, and he just mm. becomes somebody that you hunt out again. Mm. Because mm. before that show that everybody cried at, and that which kind of made him explode he was one of those designers that you either knew about or you didn't. Yeah. It's like you got it or you didn't. Yeah. And then I think there was a lot of people jumping on bandwagons being like, oh, did you cry, Gary Green? Oh, I cried. Oh, I cried more. <laughs> and sort of wanting to be part of that moment. And probably some of those people will drop off. Yeah. But actually people who really get it will, will always get it. it. Yeah, and it's interesting that people always talk about aesthetically how it's a bit Japanese because I wonder if you, he will operate in that kind of calm... Uh, yoji manner where people who love it love it and want to wear it yeah. and they're completely obsessed with it and seek it out and go to the show and people who don't really get it don't go to the show and they don't wear it and, and I think that would be an interesting place for him to find himself in. Did you did you like the show? Yeah, I thought yeah. the thing with him is it's always the same that you you look at a look and you can deconstruct it and you see it hanging on a rail and it's completely different and mm. then you put it on and you don't want to take it off kind mm. of thing mm. um, and that's you know it's all we all look at the shows but it's all it's really great product at the end of the day. Like yeah. it's a really amazing workwear piece. It's a really mm-hmm. well cut um, coat. Like I really love the whip stitch. Like the mm-hmm. longer, tre- like almost like a trench coat take this season, which I thought was. I get really frustrated when people talk about it being unwearable because it's interesting you talk about it as like product because it's like when you actually interact with it and like pick yeah. it up, mm-hmm. it's so easy to wear. Like especially because like I. Hate- like they're not as visible in the show, but you can kind of see it with like the ties and the straps. Like so many pieces are so adjustable that you can make it work perfectly yeah. for your form. And like, but mm-hmm. then I just think that that fence face is like kind of like <coughs> loomed over him, where people still think of it as like mad. Like, but even under that, that even in that fen- fence face show, they were like beautiful knitwear yeah, pieces of yeah. knitwear, like patchwork knitwear under yeah. there. But everyone just looked at the kind of. Yeah. The image for the Daily Mail kind yeah. of thing. But that is the problem of flat image in fashion, isn't it? Especially sometimes it's like things that are really well designed don't shine through in that. Is there anyone else I've missed? We didn't really talk about Lou Dalton. There's a few people, but... Did quit Lou Dalton? Yeah, I always, I love what Lou does. I think she does like a really good job and I think it's so consistent and I think it it is, it speaks to like, (laughs) it it does out of a lot of things feel really relevant, which I really like. Yeah, and also she really sticks at it and she stays faithful to LCM and yeah, it's good. But she's another one where super ambitious. Like she's always like, I want it to live beyond me. Yeah. You know, like, and I think that's brilliant because I think sometimes she's a bit of a dark horse. Like people, um, because it, it there is like a normality to it that I think sometimes means it doesn't feel as like pioneering as something like a Craig or a Graves. But it's interesting that she's still, you know, she's she's still relevant to do this. She's still there. Mm. She, you know, people still want to see the collection. And then you've got everything. You know, got Craig Green going on yeah. around. You know, so but she just sticks to it. It's yeah. um and and it has always evolved the brand as well. Yeah. It's changed. You know, yeah. but there's always a core DNA. So yeah. by like you just sort of like key pieces. She's got that in that collection. Yeah. I do wonder if she'd be, be better served not showing on the runway though. Yeah. Do you think doing a? Well, she does. I think she, it gets sometimes, so she? swallowed over by by 
the wacky stuff, which yeah. actually probably isn't selling, and her clothes are selling. And, you mm. know, she has stockers. She has a successful business, um, and they're really beautiful clothes. Um, and I think you don't really get the sense of that on the runway when they're just wishing up and down in that kind of quite anonymous space, which all the designers have to use because it's you know the show space. Mm. I think you kind of lose a lot of what she's about. And I, th- I wonder if there would be another way for her to present what she does in a way that feels a bit more distinct. Because actually mm. it, ha- it does, as you say, have its own world yeah. mm. and its own language. And I think that it, you could really explore that. But it's interesting because the designers who used to do that really well, like Kotweiler was like, oh, we would always do a presentation and it was so brilliant. They've all moved towards the runway. So I wonder if there is just like... Well, I think it's a pressure that you get and there's an idea, quite an old-fashioned idea, that a runway show is just better and it's you get better, the images up on Vogue runway and it, yeah. blah, blah, blah. And I think, you know, actually, Cotwell is a really good example, as is Wells Bonham. When they were doing their own presentations, that's how they built their world and that's how yeah. they made people want to come to their show. And actually, you're right, when you use the word world, that's why people have such a clear understanding of what they're about because yeah. those presentations they could use, you know, props or a publication, as Grace did, to really hammer home their, like, and you could spend time with it. Like you could mm. go into Wells Bonner and in and out in, in two minutes, or you could spend thirty minutes there. Yeah. And you know. Whereas yeah, you get to choose how you see the clothes. Whereas a runway show, you don't. Like, yeah. You can't it's just kind it. of thrust at you rather yeah. than you being but able to interact it's with. It's like what we did say earlier. I think those two brands, Carl and Grace, um, kind of graduated to a show, and it suited them. Like mm. it, it didn't take anything away. Mm. Whereas, didn't rush it either. Yeah. Mm. In a way. Mm. Whereas I think some people stepping like like Shannon did last season, or yeah. season before. That didn't take anything away from that collection. It was still a great collection. But he yeah. just decided not to do it on the catwalk. Yeah. I think if some if some other brands We need that flexibility definitely where yeah. people feel like they can do something that is more because as we were all saying about Gosha and that three sixty approach, like having the flexibility to say this season it's very much about the clothes, so it's gonna be a runway. Next season it's very much, you know, I've been working on thinking a lot about film or photography, you know, that, that they can work in that 360 way. Like, that's what makes fashion seem interesting. At the but I think that's a really good point about yeah. that you don't, it shouldn't be that just because you did a catwalk show for the last six months, uh, six seasons, you have to do one. I totally agree. I think there was quite a lot of um, collections that I just didn't think benefited from the mm-hmm. runway it's quite exposing and it's not you know certain brands just need a, a more intimate approach mm-hmm. and I think going back to what we said at the very beginning about how London this season felt quite one no I think part of that is because you're in the same venue yeah probably sure. looking at a lot of the same models because you know it's limited casting yeah kind of feels like sometimes you keep the same clothes yeah mm-hmm. like and actually the moments that we've all talked about that we remember and that felt like a moment were all the ones who broke away from yeah. it and did their own thing and but found a way that worked for them. Do you actually think as well, you know, like we're just saying that the designers have got to do more to create their brands now and, you know, so whether it be multimedia or whatever, you know, that they're doing that. Whereas I'm not sure LCM did that this time. Whereas Pity, you know, that was some of the best, you know, that was pretty amazing. Mm. You know, if you're a Visvim fan, you're in, you know, Gosha, that was fresh. Mm. And there was a reason, and also there was also some clothes they're going to have a look at as well at yeah. the same time that yeah. was big brands, so super classic, but also super relevant. And they haven't been relevant for years, but they mm. have been the last couple of years. So it's interesting that we, you know, that's the, you know, you've got to have a reason to come to LCM. But then who would have thought that Pity was going to, like, I do think Pity had had a, a difficult it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. time. It's genius. You know, like, Vizvin and Gosha on a list at Pity. That's yeah. genius. Yeah, it was yeah. it was perfect. But then I, I agree with you, like, I think it's a really tough time for London Collection at the moment because it's so new. We all forget how new it is because it, it so new. boomed in and was so successful. And now there's all these conversations about people showing men's and women's together, which is obviously threatening men's shows. Um, and it is hard, it's hard to pull people yeah. in. And it used like, to show on a Wednesday afternoon after Women's Wear in yeah. September. Oh right? And then you was ready, and that was yeah, it. And then it was like, yeah, yeah, there was three hours, yeah. you know, and you know, and then all of a sudden they created this bigger, you know, sort of which is great, and they, they're all committed to doing it, and then it just seems to have got diluted, and then that is a massive problem. Massive problem. But I think the problem is not with the designers yeah. themselves, no, it's with the not system at all. and the setup. It's, it's that. Yeah. But then the system the setup was great. It's just about how you evolve how you that. Evolve. Because the brands are doing it and other you know other places are doing it so we have to keep doing that and we're brilliant at doing that yeah but we just got to do a little bit more to to go for a reason to say actually you know so i kicked off you know you know why japan and america yeah. want to come they get you know we need to do a present or something and, and those presentations i know yeah. gosh it was a show and stuff but it was you know what what is the reason to come yeah yeah, yeah. we just have to change don't we we have to always keep i it suppose up. so yeah exactly Maybe that's a good note to end on. Should we give all the designers a round of applause for giving us so much to talk about? 